Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Today, the webinar will be presented by Kat Hollowell from Wichita State Athletics, and she will be presenting a case study, a collegiate volleyball player with post-concussion syndrome and low-lying cerebral tonsils. Okay, a uh, quick minute about the Center for Sport at Tulane University. So we thank you for joining us today. Um, Tulane University Center for Sport is backed by Tulane University and holds relationships with local, national, and professional sports organizations. Uh, the Center for Sport has developed an interdisciplinary network of resources, knowledge, and experience all under one roof housed at Tulane University. This puts the center in a unique position to view sport from a 360 degree perspective. Our work at Tulane University and across the nation promotes cross campus and cross discipline connections that allows us to examine crucial problems facing athletes, sport and society, as well as, as developing careers and innovative answers to issues that affect the sports industry. Uh, our mission is to educate current and future professionals in the areas of sport to improve the emotional and physical lives of athletes by advancing cutting edge sports research and health services and to inspire social change by promoting the powerful impact of sports and the role of athletes in communities. We accomplish our mission through our four pillars of education, research, clinical programs and community engagement. At this time, I am going to go ahead and introduce our presenter today. Uh, Kat Hollowell is with us from Wichita State University. Kat received her undergraduate Bachelor of Science in Sport and Exercise Science with an emphasis in athletic training from the University of Northern Colorado. Kat received her Master's of Science in Education and Sports Studies from the University of Kansas. Um, Kat's primary roles at Wichita State University, where she serves as the Assistant Director of Sports Medicine, um, is to work with the athletic programs and athletes to schedule, plan, and coordinate all pre-participation physical exams. She's the Director of Supervision of Graduate Assistant Athletic Trainer and Athletic Training Students. Um, Kat has interactions with and clinical experience working with a variety of Division I sports that includes volleyball, men's and women's tennis, men's and women's golf, women's basketball, softball, men's and women's cross country, indoor and outdoor track and field. And she also is comfortable in creating home exercise programming using online and desktop platforms. She is an improved clinical instructor where she serves from time in time as a guest lecturer for athletic training education curriculum classes and is a former instructor for athletic training education program courses including therapeutic modalities, therapeutic exercise, administration of athletic training, and therapeutic exercise with labs. <clears throat> Kat holds the license and certifications from American Heart BLS for healthcare providers. She's Gratson certified licensed athletic trainer, NADA BOC certified athletic trainer, certified physical therapist assistant. And she holds professional memberships with the National Athletic Trainers Association, Mid-America Athletic Trainers Association, and the Kansas Athletic Trainers Society. So please welcome me and join, or join me in welcoming Kat Hollowell from Wichita State. I am now going to allow Kat to share her screen and get started. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining. Like Tess said, I'm going to be presenting a case study uh, about a collegiate volleyball player with post-concussion syndrome and low-lying cerebellar tonsils. I have no disclosures. Uh, learning objectives, hopefully by the end of this, you're gonna be able to identify and understand symptoms of low-lying cerebellar tonsils, be able to classify key area malformation types, be able to explain the relationship between underlying conditions 
<clears throat> excuse me, and signs and symptoms of a concussion and be able to explain how underlying conditions can prolong the recovery of a concussion. The background uh, that I thought was pertinent to this uh, post-concussion syndrome, I think most people probably already know that it is just a common complication of a concussion where there's a persistent persistence of concussion symptoms beyond a normal amount of time, usually considered around greater than six weeks. Your highest risk factors are gonna include being female, having advanced age, a history of previous concussions, anxiety, learning disorders, seizure disorders, history of migraines, uh, a severe impact, double impact, and major visual symptoms. I included this bottom part um, just to kind of explain where I'm coming from, but the WHO has described it as a syndrome that occurs following head trauma and includes a number of desperate symptoms such as headache, dizziness, fatigue, irritability, difficulty in concentration and performing mental tasks, impairment of memory, insomnia, and reduced tolerance to stress, emotional excitement, or alcohol. And the most important part, the symptoms associated with post-concussion syndrome are not specific for the condition. PRA malformation is a structural defect of the base of the skull and the cerebellum. The cerebellum is uh, in charge of balance, coordination, and eye movements. It's, uh, normally it would sit above with the brainstem above the foramen magnum, but during Chiari, Chiari, excuse me, Chiari malformation, part of the cere uh, cerebellum extends below the foramen magnum and into the upper spinal canal. Patients with Chiari malformations can be asymptomatic, but some, particularly those with further descent into the spinal canal, classically experience headaches or neck pain, particularly after Valsalva maneuvers associated with coughing, sneezing, straining, or physical exertion. And less commonly, they may experience snoring, visual problems, and dizziness, ataxia, and sleep apnea. Type 1 is the most common form. It's where the lower part of the cerebellum, or referred to as the tonsils, extend into the frame and magnum, where the spinal cord should pass through the opening. They may not produce symptoms, and it's usually an incidental finding on examination for a different condition. And it's usually found in adolescence or early adulthood. Usually they won't have symptoms, but they can develop symptoms later in life. The risk of participation in sports is very low, even contact sports, unless there is an associated, associated syringomyelia. But there may be an increased risk for concussion and post-concussion syndrome. The neuroimaging classification for type 1 is that the cerebellar tonsils extend into the foramen magnum greater than 5 millimeters. Signs and symptoms, they're going to have a primary symptom of a headache, and it's usually going to be associated with a cough or sneeze, or it may get worse with coughing or sneezing. Neck pain, hearing or balance problems, muscle weakness or numbness, dizziness, difficulty swallowing or speaking, vomiting, tinnitus, scoliosis, insomnia, depression, and problems with hand coordination and fine motor skills. Type 2 is also referred to as Arnold Chiari malformation. That's when both the cerebellum and the brainstem protrude through the frame of magnum, and the nerve tissue that connects the two halves of the cerebellum is partially formed or missing. It's usually accompanied with a myelomeningocele, which is a form of spina bifida, and that can cause paralysis either partial or complete. Their symptoms are usually a bit more severe than type 1, and they can cause life-threatening complications in infancy and early childhood. The only treatment is surgical intervention, but that, that is not recommended as a preventative method for asymptomatic athletes with mild to moderate Chiari malformations. Symptoms of type 2 are all the type 1 symptoms, but also changes in breathing patterns, swallowing problems like gagging, quick downward eye movements, and weakness in their arms. The important thing here is there's no guideline to return to participation in athletics for type two, and there's lots of contention within the medical community due to no widely accepted beliefs and limited research available on this. Decisions should be made on a case-by-case -case basis. However, I did find uh, somewhere, I think it was a, yep, the Clinical Journal of Sports Medicine where they said most authors recommend that athletes with Chiari malformations that are symptomatic have unusually low tonsillar herniation obliteration of the subarachnoid space, syringomyelia, 
and, and or indentation of the anterior medulla avoid returning to contact or collision sports. Type three and four are rare, um, probably not gonna see it in most of the populations we deal with, but type three is a herniation of the brainstem and the cerebellum through an abnormal frame and magnum. Uh, appears in infancy and it's debilitating and life-threatening complications can occur. And you're gonna again have the same type symptoms as type one and two, but they're gonna be more severe neurological defects. And then type four, they're gonna have an underdeveloped or sometimes incomplete cerebellum and parts of the skull and spinal cord may be visible. So differentiating that between low-lying cerebellar tonsils, uh, these are clinically called benign tonsillar ectopias. Chiari-1 uh, Chiari malformations and low-lying cerebellar tonsils are two different things and need to be distinguished between the two. Uh, low-lying cerebellar tonsils are usually asymptomatic in an incidental finding in normal individuals where the tonsils protrude through the foramen magnum by no more than three to five millimeters. Um, Someone described it as patients with chronic intractable occipital dull pain and cerebello vestibular dysfunction symptoms. So here I put a picture so that you can kind of visualize exactly what I'm talking about. If you look on the left side, you'll see the herniated tonsils through the frame and magnum. And then the, on the right, you're gonna see a picture from the, the lateral view. But the interesting thing about that picture is it's actually showing what happens to the brainstem and the cerebellum tons cerebellar tonsils when the heart beats, um, and it actually increases with activity. So what it'll end up doing is pistoning up and down and blocking the flow of cerebral spinal fluid. This is an MR of the condition. On the left, you'll see that yellow line is where the frame and magnum is, and then the arrow is pointing towards the tonsils. And then if you look to the right, that is a syringomyelia or a syrinx, which is a collection or a cyst um, of cerebral spinal fluid that in, within that spinal canal. So our patient uh, demographics, her chief complaint, she was an 18 year old Caucasian female, redshirt freshman collegiate division one volleyball player, specifically a defensive specialist libero. She was a non-spoker, no tobacco use, no history of illicit drug use, and her chief complaint was worsening headaches with the onset of nausea, dizziness, and loss of appetite. She reported on her medical paperwork prior to coming to Wichita State that she had a history of migraine headaches. She had a previous concussion in high school more than a year prior. And she also reported having a normal CT scan of her brain, which actually turned out to be an MRI. At the time of her pre-participation physical in August of 2017, she reported symptoms of her concussion were resolved and that she had no further issues. She had a his history of tonsillitis and was told by an ENT when she was in fourth grade that those enlarged tonsils and adenoids would eventually need to be removed. She was referred to an ENT by Wichita State who stated that she did not need to have them removed. She also had suspected that she had had seasonal allergies, but she had never been diagnosed. Her vitals were normal and she uh, performed a baseline SCAT-3 exam. Her initial presentation was on November 14th of 2017. She came into the athletic training facility after a practice, complaining of headaches one to two times per week that were not relieved with using acetaminophen or NSAIDs. Her headaches were accompanied with dizziness, nausea, and loss of appetite. She denied a recent or acute head injury. She reported feeling like she was catching something because she also fe felt pressure between her eyes and above her eyes. Right side was worse than left. Her cranial nerve assessment was normal. She was afibril. Her pupils were equal and reactive to light. She had no tenderness to palpation to her external sinuses. No redness or cobbling of her throat, but mild sinus drainage was noted. Her tonsils were enlarged, but that was a normal presentation for her. Her ears were clear with normal presentation of her tympanic membrane. The cervical musculature was tonic in nature. And then she was sent to our on-campus student health services on the advice of a team physician after I had contacted him. While she was there, they found a new benign heart murmur. They did blood for an executive profile lab and all the tests were within normal ranges. She was treated with Zofran four milligrams orally every eight to 12 hours for her nausea and given fewer set tabs to take three times a day as needed for headaches. She had no relief of symptoms with any of these. 
was about a week after she reported her symptoms. We had a team physician on campus, so I went ahead and had her see him because her symptoms were worsening. At this point, she was unable to finish practice that day due to head pain and nausea, but she had no mechanism of inner injury for a concussion. Her headaches did not worsen with physical activity, but her nausea did. She was afibril, she had pearl, she denied fevers, chills, and neurological symptoms. She described a constant pressure in the frontal lobe of her head, especially between her eyes, with a constant headache for the past week. Her headache was described as throbbing and aching, and she rated it 10, 8 out of 10 at worst. She did say that she had headaches throughout the fall of the previous year while playing volleyball, but she never had nausea with it or pain as severe. She denied photophobia or sensitivity to sound and denied worsening symptoms with cognitive activity. Her nausea was described as transient throughout the day and not always associated with a headache. She stated that she was still eating, but she was having, her, having to force herself to do so. And her nausea would worsen with change in elevation. So walking up and down hills, up and down stairs, riding in elevators, escalators, and interestingly enough, when she would go to the floor to, to dig a ball. Medications at time of the exam, none of which relieved symptoms, were Aleve as needed, Tylenol as needed, Fioraset as needed for severe headaches, Zofran every eight hours. She reported getting eight to 10 hours of sleep at night. She believed she snored, but wasn't sure, and said she did not wake up with a headache. She reported that she was eating 2,000 to 2,500 calories per day. So the initial treatment at this point was being encouraged by our team physician to continue with the nausea medication, but to discontinue the Fioraset. He prescribed her oral prednisone, 50 milligrams daily for seven days, and asked to avoid NSAIDs while taking it. She was advised to keep a headache diary to track when headaches occur to identify possible triggers, and to follow up in one week or after she finished the course of prednisone. And she was allowed to work out as tolerated. So three weeks after she reported her symptoms, she had ta finished taking her course of prednisone and said that her headaches had completely resolved for three days, but on the fourth day, she woke up with a slight headache. She followed up with our team physician in our facility. She reported a slight headache that day, but said she also felt like it was over her sinuses and it, she was coming down with a cold. She reported sleeping close to 12 hours a night for the past week and waking up feeling rested and was advised to begin taking an antihistamine daily for possible seasonal allergy link. Continue keeping a headache diary, practice good sleep hygiene, and was instructed to work out as tolerated. So at this point, our differential diagnosis was migraine headaches or an inflammatory process, seasonal allergies, uh, which has a very uh, big environmental allergy hotspot, uh, especially in the fall, and a viral infection. Four weeks after report of symptoms, she traveled out of state to spend winter break with her family and was contacted weekly about her symptoms, sometimes without response. At seven weeks, uh, she reported continued headaches with nausea and dizziness. She stated that her mother wanted her to see a PCP at home since her HMO only worked there. Her PCP referred her to an ENT and a neurologist for further testing. The ENT diagnosed her with migraine headaches and benign tonsillitis and she was unable to get into a neurologist prior to coming back to school. At nine weeks, I received a phone call from the student athlete's mother saying her daughter had called her to tell her that she had, couldn't stop shaking and was nauseous. During that conversation, her mother told me that her daughter had a concussion in high school from being thrown into a wall head first by a friend. She did not believe that her daughter had ever completely been symptom free since the incident and she believed that her daughter feared that she would not be cleared if she told us. After that concussion, she had seen her PCP and a neurologist within the first few months, and after a normal MRI of her brain, she was cleared for school and volleyball. From that point forward, she would get migraine, migraine headaches, especially after playing love, long club tournaments in high school. And she said that her daughter's headaches had become more frequent after she started a birth control in July of 2017, but she had stopped taking it by October 2017. So she thought there might be a hormonal link to them worsening. The student athlete had had a cervical MRI in January of 2018 to check for cervical impingement with no results as that phone, that, per that phone conversation. 
Her younger brother had been recently diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, so on the suggestion of his endocrinologist, the young lady had an ANA test that was positive and was referred to a rheumatologist. She reported that her headaches were actually worse when she came back from winter break than when, before she left. Her most recent headache had started right before her individual practice the day prior and not gone away. And it started in the middle of her head and moved towards her right eye. Most of her headaches had been a uh, gradual onset, but that day it had come on suddenly. And she described that her vision got fuzzy, and, but she had never completely lost vision or had any sort of blind spots. She had started taking Excedrin migraine for her headaches on the advice of a neurologist that she saw at home, and she said it helped. She was prescribed amitriptyline, but did not fill the prescription due to concerns by her mother, mostly about side effects. She denied any loss of motor function and her cranial nerves, reflexes, dermatones, and myotomes were all normal. And she was cleared for activity as tolerated for conditioning and light weightlifting, which we were in the spring at this point. So that's pretty much what we were doing. Uh, but she was removed from participation in any volleyball skills by me due to safety concerns with the dizziness and visual disturbances and the increase in symptoms with activity. At 10 weeks, she followed up with our team physician again to discuss that her headaches were getting worse. She provided a brain MRI report from 10-19-16 that showed right maxillary sinus disease, but nothing really else, um, everything else was insignificant. She asked to be referred to an ENT along with a rheumatologist due to the positive ANA blood titer. Both of them diagnosed her with migraine headaches. And she'd also described instances of shortness of breath lasting less than a minute. Her vitals were normal, her lungs were clear, she had no strider, and it was thought to be related to panic attacks. At this point, she admitted to having headaches daily since November and that were present upon waking and lasted all day. Her headaches were nor normally in the frontal lobe. Sometimes she would have some occipital lobe pain or cervical region pain, and her pain ranged between six to eight out of 10 pain daily. She had been taking Excedrin migraine three to four times a week, but only when her pain reached eight out of 10. And she, at this point, was advised by our team physician to start taking riboflavin and magnesium supplementation, and then to follow up in one month. And then she was asked to obtain all her test results that she had over winter break with her PCP. So the differential at this point was rebound headaches from the Excedrin mag migraine that she was taking amongst the other uh, NSAIDs. Tension headaches, atypical migraines, and a possible link to post-concussion syndrome. At 14 weeks, she still had no improvement in symptoms. She would come to practice sporadically to, due to complaints of increasing symptoms while sitting at practice. At this point, she wasn't doing any activity. She was just sitting at practice and listening to instruction. She was treated with cervical manual traction, trigger point therapy, soft tissue massage, all to the cervical musculature for the cervicogenic symptoms. And again, she followed up with our team physician who advised her to continue with her headache diary and only attend practice to watch when necessary as symptoms would allow and to continue the riboflavin and magnesium supplementation. At 19 weeks uh, after the symptom report, she said that she was gonna see another neurologist at home over spring break, or she did see one over spring break that diagnosed her with migraine headaches her mother called again saying that the student athlete had been working on the computer over spring break and after several hours noticed her eyes began to physically migrate to different positions with the right eye turning out, outward and upward um, and it stayed in that position. At that point, she was referred to a team optometrist who diagnosed her with a slight astigmatism but felt it was too slight to correct. And he suspected that she had convergence insufficiency and suggested that she go um, into vision therapy and then she was also given blue light blocking glasses, but she said those didn't help with her symptoms. We contacted student services at this point to arrange for accommodations in the classroom due to difficulty working on computers and looking at screens in class. This young lady was a business major and everything she did was on the computer for the most part for class. Um, so now she was unable to sit at practice without an increase in symptoms. So she was put on cognitive rest for 48 hours and advised not to attend practice for the remainder of that week. 28 weeks post-report, she returned home for summer. She followed up with a third neurologist who ordered another brain MRI. 
Um, at this point, he had prescribed her a beta blocker called propanol, pro, I'm going to, I'm butchering this, I'm sorry, propranolol. Um, she was tested for and diagnosed with bilateral peripheral vestibular hypofunction and given a script for VOR therapy. But at the time, her family and her declined to move forward with that therapy. A lot of it had to do with financial. Um, her insurance didn't cover it. She saw a cardiologist for a possible link to POTS. Uh, while she was at Wichita State, we did orthostatic BPs to rule that out, and all of them were positive for orthostatic hypotension. But she ended up having a negative tilt table test, and they diagnosed her with migraines. She also followed up with an endocrinologist for the, the link to diabetes, but her A1C was normal, and she scored positive on only two of five genetic markers. At 36 weeks, she returned to Wichita and dropped off an MRI disc with the report that stated that she had mild cerebellar tonsillar ectopia with the tip of the tonsils extending approximately three and a half millimeters below the foramen magnum. She was told by her PCP that that met the classification for type one Chiari malformation. She had enlarged tonsils and adenoids with mildly enlarged cervical nodes, a tiny polyp or mucus retention cyst on the floor of her right maxillary sinus hypoplastic posterior communicating arteries of the brain without aneurysm, mild disc desiccation of the cervical discs from C2, C3 through C6, C7 with no disc protrusion or stenosis, and a three millimeter nerve root sheath cyst in the right neural foramen at C7, T1. Her family neurologist cleared her for participation and gave her a script for VOR therapy. Our team physician and a local neurologist reviewed the MRI results and didn't believe that she met that criteria for Chiari malformation type 1, but instead diagnosed her with low-lying cerebellar tonsils. At 38 weeks, uh, we did our pre-participation exams and she reported that she had improved symptoms. After a consult with a neurologist, she was cleared for volleyball participation as tolerated. Two days after her PPE, she was attempting to track a serve during a serve and pastoral at practice when she became dizzy, lost track of the ball, tripped, and hit her head on the floor. At that point, she was immediately removed from participation. We performed a SCAT-3 exam, but her results were within her normal baseline exam. She went on neurocognitive rest for 48 hours, and she was referred back to our team physician, who officially diagnosed her with post-concussion syndrome with convergence insufficiency and referred her to a vision uh, therapist and VOR therapy. At 39 weeks, she was officially evaluated, diagnosed with, and began vision therapy for convergence insufficiency, and began taking amitriptyline as prescribed by her PCP. So our differential diagnosis, uh, low-lying cerebellar tonsils versus Chiari malformation type one, uh, post-concussion syndrome, convergence insufficiency, bilateral peripheral vestibular hypofunction. Lots of things going on here. 45 weeks later, uh, she discontinued the amitriptyline because she did not feel like it helped. She consulted with physicians at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia Sports Medicine and Performance Center via Skype. And they recommended, uh, or that was on the recommendation of her third neurologist, and they recommended that she do the VOR therapy as well as vision therapy for convergence insufficiency. They also said she should do the, the bulk test protocol, and if it went well, uh, that she could begin the Buffalo protocol on a treadmill or bike if she felt well enough and when her symptoms were below four out of 10. Based on that recommendation, our team physician actually suggested that she do a modified Buffalo protocol when she felt able to due to her symptoms never being below four out of 10 um, at best. And when una unable to tolerate, she could move to the bike as tolerated. So our protocol was uh, she must have symptoms less than seven out of 10 before starting and the symptoms must not get worse throughout the testing. Instead of starting at 3.6, which is based on her height, we started at a comfortable pace and based, based on her comfort. And then once she felt able, we increased that speed to 3.6 at a 0% incline. The incline was increased by 1% every one minute after 3.6 was achieved. And then after a 10% 10% incline, uh, was, when it was reached, the speed would be increased by 0.2 miles per hour every minute. So at 63 weeks, she was referred back to our team physician because her symptoms were now getting worse. 
And after attempting the modified Buffalo proto protocol multiple times, she was unable to get past the incline of 1% for one minute. She was able to walk for five minutes at 3.6 with 0% incline until experiencing an increase in symptoms. She was able to mildly exert herself on a stationary bike for up to 15 minutes without any increase in symptoms. And she presented with tension like headaches cervi or cervicogenic type symptoms and tissue texture changes. So at that point, our team physician treated her with osteopathic manipulative treatment or OMT. That didn't help her symptoms. I treated her with some manual therapies for cervicogenic headaches. Again, manual traction, stretching, instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization and none of those helped her symptoms. And in fact, she said she almost felt like they made, her, made it worse. So we discontinued it at that time. She was referred to uh, our, our testing, counseling and testing center on campus for a psych evaluation for some depressive symptoms and put on Zoloft by our student health center. She was then discharged from vision therapy because they said that her eye convergent, convergence testing was normal. And at 72 weeks, she started her VOR therapy at a local rehab hospital three times a week with a therapist who specialized in vestibular dysfunction. The physical therapist started cervical strengthening exercises with her as well, and continued, she continued on the manual therapies to treat cervicogenic symptoms. She completed four weeks of VOR therapy with improved headache symptoms, but continued to get dizzy um, in certain circumstances. But she was able to, once she started, attend class without worsening symptoms, participate in an integrated return to attending practice without participation, um, just only sitting at practice. And we started at 30 minutes and increased it by 30 minutes about every two days with no increase in symptoms. Well, that was great. At 75 weeks post report of symptoms, she was able to actually sit at practice for four or five days, four of the five days without increase in symptoms. Um, she would still have headaches two to three times a week, but with varying severity. So there were days that they were too bad that she couldn't come in to practice. And so we let her have cognitive rest those days. So of all of these interventions and treatments, we did neurocognitive rest, magnesium and riboflavin supplementation, amitriptyline, Zofran, allergy medication, prednisone and various NSAIDs, um, beta blocker, convergence insufficiency therapy, vestibular ocular reflex therapy, sleep hygiene, OMT, cervical exercise strengthening protocol, soft tissue techniques, and then progressive physical exertion. Ultimately, at the end of the spring of 28, or excuse me, 2019, she decided that she didn't want to continue with her uh, collegiate volleyball career for fear of another concussion. Um, at that time, she admitted that she hadn't been completely honest with us because she was afraid that she wouldn't be able to play volleyball. She ended up transferring to another university closer to home after the fall of 2019. She is currently doing well, but does continue to require academic accommodations for symptoms and continues to wear the blue light blocking glasses when she's on the computer. And she also said sometimes when she's driving at night. She continues with VOR therapy at home with symptoms improving. She doesn't have headaches daily and her headaches have come with less severity and her dizziness has improved significantly. She also said yesterday that her nausea is, um, it's again transient, but it doesn't happen nearly as often. So some considerations. Um, first of all, the big question for me is should volleyball be considered a non-traditional contact sport? They do during a typical practice, they'll have hundreds of collisions a day with the floor, with the ball, and with teammates without any protective equipment. Um, we don't treat volleyball like it is a collision sport, but maybe we should start treating it, especially in certain positions, like a libero or defensive specialist. Um, the, the things you have to understand with volleyball is the velocity of the ball on a serve is going you know, 40 to 50 miles an hour in some cases. And it's sometimes it's floating, so it's hard to track. And if you don't track it correctly, it doesn't hit your platform correctly. And there's a chance that it could either ricochet off and shank and hit a teammate in the head, or it can come up and hit you in the face. Um, and then when they hit the ball, I mean, a, a collegiate women's volleyball player could hit the ball between 50 to 60 miles per hour, and maybe some more faster than that. So my big question is, should we actually be considering volleyball a non-traditional contact sport? 
And then how do we better educate and address student athletes and remove the stigma of being pulled if they have a concussion? I feel like I do a fairly good job with the volleyball team at Wichita State in educating them about concussion and about signs and symptoms and what can happen, but I don't think we do probably a good enough job at times of um, explaining the why of being pulled. And even if we do, do you explain the why, um, sometimes they just choose not to believe it or choose not to think that it'll affect them. And then as concussion research continues to improve, um, should we have a greater emphasis on the effect of underlying conditions on concussion? Now, I've been out of school for almost 20 years, and I can tell you when I was in undergrad or grad school, we didn't really talk about how underlying conditions affect concussion. And I don't know if necessarily things have changed that much in terms of that. I think we've gotten better at concussions. I just don't know if we've gotten better about talking about things outside of the concussion that may affect the concussion. And then what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Do the underlying conditions contribute or are they arising from the concussion? And where do you start um, in cases where they do have multiple conditions that could be affecting it or the, the symptoms are not specific to that concussion, might be specific to a different condition? Um, which do you, you start with? Who do you treat first? Um, and then what are the long-term implications and complications of not addressing symptoms early? That one I think we kind of already have the answer to. Um, it's not good, but at the same time, um, do we really know? And for this young lady, she's been suffering for almost four years now, actually four years now. So um, I think for her, she probably has some regrets and it's probably better to... Um, allow someone like that to talk to our athletes so they understand that there are long-term implications when they aren't honest or they do not report. So um, anyway, those are some, some considerations that I um, had during this, this entire project, if you will. So I have some references and I appreciate everyone's attention and time. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Kat, for going through that. Um, case study at this time, Dr. Gregory Stewart from Tulane University is going to lead the Q&A. If anybody has a question that they want to uh, ask, please put it in the Q&A feature at the bottom and we will address them as we go through. Thank you, Kat, for a very interesting presentation on what's a very difficult case. And I think all those questions you pose at the end, I thought you were going to answer all of those during the, the presentation. Uh, I think those are the kinds of things that we all uh, struggle with uh, in, in this group. And thanks to Tess for uh, coordinating and directing all of the educational activities for the Center for Sport. Uh, if anyone's interested in presenting uh, on one of these in the future, please uh, email Tess. Uh, one of the first questions, uh, Kat, on the riboflavin and magnesium. Can you, can you talk about that uh, a little bit? So um, there's been a little bit of research that there's a possible link between vitamin or mineral deficiency in uh, headaches. Um, magnesium, riboflavin, um, there, there's no definitive that they work. Um, we thought it was worth a try. Um, for um, this particular case as NSAIDs didn't work and it ultimately failed, um, but it was just something we were trying based on some research that's out there. So were there any differences between the two MRIs? Um, the first MRI actually did not show that she had, it wasn't a very particularly good MRI, um, and we actually never were, was, we were never able to actually get the images themselves. It was just the report. Um, but I did talk to her mother and she said that the PCP said that it was not a very good MRI and actually did not get the entire um, cerebellum. So the only, only differences were the things I listed. I mean, there was quite a bit of 
of uh, information on the second one. I have to think that those things did not just appear. They were probably on the first one, just not read that way. When you were dealing with the coaches, um, how did you communicate with them during this process? Uh, and how much uh, pushback did you, uh, did you have from them? Um, I actually had it pretty easy with this young lady, uh, simply because her family was good family friends with my head coach. So um, yes, there was some pushback. Um, they didn't understand what was going on. When you say tonsils, they think tonsils in your throat. So there was a lot of education as ter in terms of what that actually meant with pictures and, and describing why it's a bad thing um, and how it could be related to the concussion. Um, I have a pretty old school coach who is finally coming around to understanding concussions and believing that they exist and that there needs to be some rest. Um, so he was fairly easy to work with. He just wanted to know what she could do. If she could do something, he wanted her to do it. And one of those compromises was allowing her to sit at practice and listen to skills instruction, um, which ultimately also had to end at a certain point simply because she just couldn't handle it. Um, we came to determine it's probably a lot of the fact that she had convergence insufficiency and being in a gym with volleyballs everywhere, it's impossible not to watch them because you're obviously from a safety standpoint trying not to get hit. Um, we do three courts in one gym, so there are balls everywhere. So, you know, she ended up, I think, probably trying to watch the action and, and that caused some of the convergence insufficiency issues that probably increased her symptoms. Um, he could see it. You could always tell when she had an increase in symptoms, she would turn white, her facial expressions would change. She's a, she's a great kid and very bubbly, happy kid. And you could tell because she wouldn't be that bubbly, happy kid. So he could tell and he could see what she was going through. So it was a lot easier, I think, for him to understand that she was really having issues and to be okay with it. Um, it also helped at the time we had several defense specialists and liberos um, ahead of her. So it wasn't, um, a necessity like if she would have been a starting libero it might have been a little bit different i'm not sure um but i had it pretty easy and did you bring in any mental health resources into uh, the overall management yes we did um she was very resistant to um seeking out or accepting any mental health um i think a lot of it had to do with the stigma but we eventually convinced her that she needed to go see somebody and do um, a psychological evaluation. And that's why she got put on Zoloft because she had some depressive symptoms. And I think she realized at a certain point that she needed the help. Um, we didn't push it on her simply because if they aren't ready for help, it isn't gonna help. So we kind of just waited until she was ready. And did you ever talk about medical disqualification uh, during the process uh, with her? Um, we tried to not talk about it with her because we were afraid that she would be dishonest with us. Um, but there were a lot of conversations between myself, the coaching staff, and um, our team physician. And there were times where she and I would have a private conversation about, you know, these are the risks. This is what, you know, could potentially happen. Um, we're not there now, but wanted to prepare you. And I think she kind of knew that that was going to happen anyway. So that's why she ultimately decided herself it was going to be on her terms that she didn't play volleyball anymore. And one of the things that's come up, and I know that, that we have issues at, uh, at different schools, manage things differently, but overall from a payment standpoint, how much did, uh, was her insurance, how much did the university pick up, uh, and how much was just kind of managed? So she is a unique case in the fact that she came in with a pre-existing condition and we don't cover pre-existing conditions at Wichita State. Um, she had an HMO from the home state or from her home state at the time. She did switch to the um, undergraduate health insurance offered on campus for uh, a year, but found that it really didn't pay for much and she, her mother looked into some other insurances and really found that most of the stuff that we were trying to accomplish wasn't going to be covered under any type of insurance because it's all still considered, um, I guess, experimental. So in the terms of insurance, so 
she ended up ultimately going back on the HMO and doing most of the imaging and stuff, the more expensive stuff the insurance will cover while she was at home. And it actually ended up being perfect because about the time that we were deciding that this needed to happen, she was going home anyway. So um, it made it a little bit more challenging for us to get records, obviously, and to get the images and the, the timeliness of it was delayed. But you know, ultimately we always leave it up to our student athletes anyway, what they wanna do in terms of, you know, where they want to get stuff done. Um, and I think she probably would have chosen to do it that way anyway. So a couple questions from the, the visual standpoint, I'm going to kind of put them all together. Uh, one is just some general resources behind the blue light, if you have something uh, along that. And then on some of the, uh, the, the VOR, it seemed that, uh, she was reluctant initially, but ultimately this is what helped. Uh, do you think having started that earlier would have made a difference? Oh, absolutely. I think she realizes now that that probably made the biggest difference in her recovery um, and the changes that she's experienced. Um, the blue light blocking glasses, uh, that was through our team optometrist and a suggestion from her family optometrist, uh, but it reduces eye strain. And they thought too, if she was using that while she was on the computer, maybe she would sleep better. Um, even though she was reporting that she was sleeping well, you know, even I can tell you, I have a, a, a Fitbit and I don't sleep nearly as well as I think I do. So we also wanted to see, you know, maybe that would help with some of like the snoring and the, and the, the unrest at night. And maybe if that got better, then she would be able to, um, she would re reduce her symptoms a little bit. Um, and then in terms of VOR, um, like I said, yes, I think she should have done that initially, but what we found out and what I found out through research and, and calling, um, people around that I know, not just around Wichita, but the state of Kansas and outside of the state of Kansas who, um, are involved in this, um, type of therapy is unless you do your convergence and sufficiency therapy first, your vision therapy, your VOR will not get better. Your therapy, it will not help you you have to get past that first um, in order to, for VOR. So she would have had to have done the vision therapy prior to this anyway. So she wouldn't have gotten onto it, you know, within the first four weeks if we would have just initially, if she would have just done it. Um, but I do feel like she probably would have felt better sooner and maybe she wouldn't have as long lasting effects and symptoms if she would have done it initially. Um, you know, back in 2017, you know, it's kind of emerging in athletic training and, I honestly didn't feel comfortable doing um, what I refer to as a joke as back alley therapy, where I look up something online and I try to do it. Um, so we really felt it was important that she see somebody who specializes in that. And there aren't a ton of people actually um, that do specialize in that, that actually have training, you know, real training, not something that they just learned at a CEU course. So I was very diligent in looking to see who actually had an extra certification or specialty in that instead of just referring her to somebody who claims to be a concussion specialist. And I, the, the lady that we sent her to was absolutely phenomenal. And um, she's was a very big proponent of doing the visual therapy also first. Um, and honestly, I think probably with the treadmill testing, a lot of it probably had to do with the fact that she was having to move her head while she was on the treadmill and that created her symptoms. So um, if she wouldn't have decided to end her career, I probably would have tried that again and gotten her on there to see if she was able to do it. Um, but she ended up not returning before she was even done with her VOR therapy and she still does it to this day, but, um, and it's been a year. So uh, another question, we've had uh, several that have come through about the low-lying cerebellar tonsils, uh, and a couple of individuals have indicated they're kind of seeing more uh, of this on different reports. Uh, and do you think that some of this is, you know, with regard to uh, just being read more, is it, is it really... Is it out there? Do we need more information and education about that? And in this case, do you think that uh, this was a result of the concussion, a cause of the concussion, or just an incidental finding that may have contributed to prolonged symptoms? 
So I'm in no mean, by no means an expert. Um, I actually had never heard of it prior to this young lady. So I had to do an extensive amount of research and talking to neurologists and talking to our team physician who also had to do the same thing. He had seen it several times um, prior to her and I believe it was an incidental finding. She probably had it the whole time. Um, I believe it is considered a congenital uh, abnormality, not something that you develop over time based on everything I've found. So she's had them. Now, did they get worse? I don't know. Um, like I said, I'm not an expert, um, but I do think probably we're just getting better at imaging and getting better at reading imaging and getting better at identifying things in imaging than we were probably 10, even 10, 15 years ago. Um, and I think our images are, from a clarity standpoint, are getting better. So, you had a lot of individuals involved in, in her care. So talk a little bit about how you managed uh, both the, the uh, flow of information, keeping everybody on the same page with regard to her care. Um, to be 100% honest, her mom actually helped me a lot. Um, I had probably weekly, if not daily conversations with her from time to time, you know, throughout this process. Um, sometimes it would be more frequent when the young lady was having more symptoms and sometimes it'd be less frequently, but really her mom would put everything into documents for me. And I was able to sort things through when they came from home. And she and I, uh, and obviously this young lady had, had um, given me a release to, to do this with her mom, but, um, her mom would send me stuff and then when we would do stuff in Wichita, I would send it to her mom. And so I literally just had a spreadsheet and a systematic system of, okay, this is who she's seen. Do we have paperwork? Do we have notes? Do we have the images? Um, I'm a kind of a OCD when it comes to organizing like that. Um, so I would follow up with, for the longest time I followed up with the young lady, but I was really getting nowhere. So um, she's, I love her to death, but she's not the most responsible young lady. Um, at times. So her mom would, would get all of the information that I needed and I would pass it on to our team physician and he and I worked very closely. Uh, again, almost daily, I was talking to him about this young lady um, and trying to sort through and writing things out and figuring out where do we go now from, you know, from here, where, where are we at, where are we go. And, and I guess that kind of some of the next question is that, you know, she did have a lot of things going on. Um, and you had to kind of sort through all of that. So the fact that she was on multiple medications, did, did that impact how long it took you to kind of come to the conclusive diagnosis? Um, it probably was a factor in it, but I don't think it's the thing that kept us from that. Um, if anything, some of them actually helped us come to that conclusion when they didn't work. So did, when this stuff coming in, does this, uh, have y'all changed how you look at uh, incoming uh, athletes, uh, pre-participation uh, questionnaires? Do you ask extra questions? Do you uh, do anything else, especially with regard to previous concussion? Uh, yes, uh, it's an ever evolving system at Wichita State, as I'm sure it is at other places. In fact, the last few weeks during the pandemic, we've actually been doing a lot of revamping our concussion protocols and figuring out what we're going to do um, moving forward. But I think the biggest thing was when somebody answers yes, is okay, now there's some more questions that need to be, to be answered. Um, and then as they get a concussion, um, you know, okay, what factors are we going to consider are maybe affecting this? And the, the questions that I posed, you know, like ADHD and learning disorders and mental health all apparently clearly have effect, but how do they affect it? And I think it's more of us educating each other on how that affects and then going through it, a, a more um, thorough examination. We do a lot more with our um, concussion screening than we used to. Um, and I don't know if this necessarily changed it, but it definitely revamped my desire to do more. So when you look back, especially given the fact that we're talking about uh, looking at what's going on, do you think her symptoms might have been worse at the younger age? 
uh, and that that maybe uh, you know the symptoms may not have truly gotten worse. That maybe this was uh, just college life, or uh, or you know, she truly had a new concussion. Uh, and follow up to that, did you ever look at go back to her high school academics and and how did their college academics compare? Um, so that would be a, it would be difficult to answer. Um, I think. Well, one, um, one of the uh, factors that was a, you know, light, light bulb in the head uh, later on was she was one of the only freshmen that didn't come in over the summer because she was having to repeat classes from high school. So it clearly affected her academics in high school. Um, do I think she had these bad symptoms before? I, I absolutely do. I, I do think they got worse. But I, I think she was at a high level before she came. I think, though, in high school, athletics is not as intense as it is, and the pressures aren't on, on you aren't as great as they are when you go to college. I think your freshman year is the most difficult, especially for volleyball players in the spring or in the fall, because they're not a spring sport. They start right off the bat, and they start with volleyball before school even starts. So you have four hours of volleyball a day, traveling, being gone for four or five days a week on top of starting school, which is up a level from what you had in high school. And I think all of those factors probably contributed to this, absolutely. And then as, as we get into some of the stuff with regard to uh, both the MRI and, and some of the imaging, uh, did you ever have any kind of, whether it was live imaging uh, on the MRI to see if the tonsils were moving during the heart rate, uh, or did you do any other kinds of testing to see, um, to evaluate the spinal, the flow of the spinal fluid? We did not. Um, one, I, I don't think we thought it was necessary. Um, two, she wasn't really able to be physically active at that point. So just from a symptom standpoint, so really trying to do too much with her, I don't think would have went well. Um, and I also don't think that her family would have wanted it done in Wichita. They would have wanted it done where she's from. And I think that would have been a lot harder for us to, um, I guess, get a hold of. Um, obviously we wouldn't be there while it's happening. It would be a recording. So if there was something that our physician saw and wanted to repeat, we wouldn't be able to. But I don't know if you know, that's a hard question to answer because I don't know if our physician ever really considered doing that at the time. And and based on all of this, um, and, and granted, she wasn't honest coming in on, on having had a concussion, but consider doing any additional uh, testing or vestibular ocular kinds of things, uh, testing in individuals who came in uh, with a history of concussion? Uh, we have had discussions at length about doing something like that, um, but our physicians haven't quite gotten on board with the, that theory that that would be the, the determining factor on somebody um, or that that would be something that would be worth the expense, um, knowing that we could test it without having a... Um, I guess, procedure, if that makes sense. Um, and without a baseline pre-concussed, it would be difficult, I think, to interpret. So if somebody has had a concussion, they're not honest, and they come in and they do that, is that truly their baseline? And that's a discussion that we've had many, many times in regard to this young lady and her SCAT-3, was that actually her baseline? Um, probably her new baseline, but was that actually her baseline? And should we have been, you know, comparing the SCAT-3 that I did, the two that I did prior to, or after that happened to the prior SCAT-3 baseline. And in all this, did you do any type of sleep studies or, or anything uh, like that to see if sleep apnea or anything else was, was a problem? We did consider it. Uh, we did not move forward with it. Um, I don't recall the reason why at this point, but I, it was a discussion, but we ultimately decided not to. And then the last question, um, you all were, would go along, kind of keep working on pushing some of the uh, physical activity 
uh, as she was doing different uh, types of maneuvers. And question is, uh, why was there such a push uh, if even some of the minor uh, activity caused uh, symptoms? Um, it really wasn't a push. Um, we thought, well, one part of, you know, the, with the research out there, they're saying, you know, let's get them moving that, you know, cognitive rest for 48 to 72 hours, but then get them moving and that actually can help resolve symptoms. Um, we were just trying to see if, hey, can we get her past that threshold? And maybe if we can get her past that threshold, um, she could start feeling better. Um, but if she didn't feel good, and there were very few days that she had a headache less than seven out of 10, that we didn't, we didn't push her. So um, we kind of let her guide us in that um, a little bit more than we probably would otherwise. Um, but again, you know, things have changed. Research has gotten better. Um, we know more now than we did three years ago, you know, so. Yes. That's my answer. <laughs> Uh, well, Kat, again, thank you very much for the uh, presentation uh, and spending the time to answer the questions. Uh, at this point, Tess, I'm going to uh, hand it all back to you to uh, finish the wrap up and uh, take us home. All right. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you again, Kat, for um, taking the time to present this case study to us today. Uh, for all attendees, there will be, um, for the credit claiming process, an email that goes out to everybody that has um, logged on to the webinar today. It will be sent to the email address that you received the Zoom link from. So whatever you registered with, please check there. It will include the uh, course assessment and evaluation. Upon completion of that, you will receive issued your statement of credit for the webinar today. Please allow 24 hours to 48, you know, somewhere in that ballpark to receive your credit. Again, if for some reason you um, think that you haven't received it, uh, please do email the email address that is on the screen, Center for Sport underscore education at Tulane.edu, and I will get back to you. Um, for uh, the webinar recordings for this um, case study recording that we just did will be up in a couple of days. Um, you can go to the Center for Sport at Tulane um, website under the education uh, tab, and it will be in the email as well. So if you want to go back and review anything, or um, if you happen to miss one of our previous recordings, they are there as well. Um, and then also we will be having on that site a request for, for proposals. So if anybody is interested, any attendees are interested in presenting on a topic, um, please do feel free to uh, complete that request for proposal and we will be in contact with you. Um, so thank you again to everybody for attending and to our panelists and Dr. Stewart for joining us today on the webinar. Thank you and have a good day.